I'm very excited uh, to invite to the stage here at the Berlin University of the Arts in our almost weekly public lecture series, Juxtaposition, Perspectives on Cultural or Contemporary Cultural Production, Li Ning. Uh, Li Ning, please come to the stage. Um, he's a multi-talent. He's a give a warm applause for Li Ning. Li Ling is a singer, a dancer, a model, an actor, a photo photo photographer, a co-screenwriter and short film director mm. um, from Berlin, born in Berlin. Um, and um, I'm very, very excited to have uh, you with us today and kind of share your practice. It will be a surprise. You can just click and it's going to be your first slide. Perfect. Thank, Thank you for you being so here. Much. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's beautiful to see you. I'm Pear, uh, my artist name is Li Ning. I am not all of the things that were just said. I am mostly just me, and I guess that's maybe also the core of what I wanna share today, um, because I'm reading all these attributes all the time and people love to come up with them. Uh, you touch something and all of a sudden you become a photographer or uh, whatever and I read them and I'm like well I guess or not um, yeah when Lucas asked me to be here and to talk about my work and my creation and my process I was quite scared in the beginning because I thought there's gonna be a room full of people that are probably more advanced to teach me something than I am to teach you because you're all learning so much right now and this is super exciting um, but then I was I sat myself down and I thought about the topic of uh, transdisciplinary work and I saw that there's definitely some things that I would love to share um, because I had a very um, I had a very special I want to say upbringing and I think that nurtured a lot of the work that I'm doing today and by maybe sharing you sharing a little bit of it with you or giving you a few glimpses uh, it can motivate you to dig into your own creation and uh, go into your own past and reflect on what you what where you are who you are uh, who you are with and then get something out of it that you want to share and communicate. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I structured this talk in three stages. Um, my upbringing, and then the years after high school, which I call my years of yes. Um, and then uh, my, the work on my debut album that is coming out next year. I think those are like three points of my life that are very um, beautiful to portray how to work interdisciplinary mm, upbringing. Why do I want to talk about my upbringing? Um, I think especially in times of TikTok and of uh, creation by AI, artificial intelligence, uh, the question of um, authorship becomes more and more important and also more and more obsolete because as you might see in your timelines, you find something in your discovery on whatever platform, you're interested in it, intrigued, and you click on it and there's no story. There's no person that created it, there's no nothing. And you're just confronted with a sheer fact that might in fact be complete bullshit. Um, and so what do you do with that information? You look at it and you keep scrolling and maybe you reproduce it, maybe you ignore it, maybe you forget it. It becomes a little bit uninteresting and not so important. And to me personally, I think it's beautiful to go into the history of a creator because you get such an in-depth view on what you're actually presented with. So if you see maybe a white square somewhere hanging in an exhibition space, this square might first just be a fucking white square, but then when you know why somebody came up with it and why somebody created it and what motivated this work, then sometimes it becomes a lot bigger and a lot more important 
to you also personally. And so this is why I want to give you this uh, insight. I'm trying to be very vulnerable with you. I might forget a few things, uh, but you can always ask afterwards. Um, so yeah, I want to start with a sentence. I grew up a mixed race child with a white single mom in a co-op house share in the mid 90s in Prenzlauer Berg. This is one sentence and it already carries so much information. It carries so much information about me. Uh, you learn that I grew up post-German war, which means in a time where Germany was very excited, but also frightened. There were a lot of political clashes happening, especially in Berlin, because this is where, in fact, it had the biggest impact. Uh, people were um, not being able to see their families, but living very close together. So this is kind of like the atmosphere that I grew up in. You also learn that I grew up in what then was, or previously was, East Berlin, um, a part of the city that didn't have the money to rebuild what was destroyed during the Second World War. So there was a lot of abandoned, abandoned houses, um, not much electricity, it was quite dark, quite grim. Um, and after the wall, there was this huge wave of people from the West coming into East Berlin and seizing the opportunity of very cheap uh, land and cheap houses and started building. And obviously, when you have the opportunity to build something fresh, something new out of what previously was almost a vast land, it, is, it brings excitement and it brings a sort of companionship and interest in people and the people around you. So this is another information that you find in that one sentence. Uh, furthermore, uh, you understand that I grew up in a probably more liberal left environment. I grew up in a house share, which means I grew up in a house with 25 people. We shared our food supplies, we shared uh, common rooms, uh, sanitary rooms. Um, we learned a lot from one another and we created political uh, projects. This is another thing that you learn in that sentence. I face discrimination as a person of color in a very white environment, which is something that also nurtures my work now. Um, back then, not as present. This is something that I needed to go through to reflect on over the years to then manifest it in art. And then also what you also learn is that I grew up with a single mom a singular powerhouse, female powerhouse, that um, also gave me a lot of uh, insight on what I'm doing today. You probably do not know who I am or what I do. I am a singer, mostly. I create music, mostly. But I would always say that I am a storyteller, that I love to um, find complex structures, complex stories, and put them in uh, very simplified structures so they can nurture other people and be more accessible. Um, this is kind of like my goal in whatever I want to do. So um, yeah, I want to bore you a little bit with my upbringing and the house project. Uh, maybe it makes sense later on, maybe not. And in between, I want to uh, play some random sounds which I copied from Lucas. They're not as uplifting as maybe the sounds that you previously played, um, but those are recordings that I recorded over the past years um, randomly on walks, in clubs, on a boat, um, sounds that were doing something with me or an atmosphere that inspired me that I wanted to revisit and I kind of want to share with you like the, the randomness of creation and how important it is to sometimes also treat them as random as they are. And that these sounds uh, can come back to you 
and when I record them, I don't record them with a purpose. I don't record them with a vision in my head. I record them because they do something with me in that very moment. And so that I have the possibility that later on, when I'm working on something and I'm reminded of a certain situation, when I want to make a message come across and I know I, I feel it needs this like warmth that I've experienced once, and I can revisit the sound and I can use this sound either as inspirational source or as an actual sound that I'm then transferring into music. So these sounds are random. Maybe they do something with you. They're sh very short. I try to keep the TikTok 15 seconds. Um, and I'm just going to continue my talk after each sound. Wait, can I click this? Oh, yes. This was the first sound. I also, I felt like this is almost like a meditative practice to me, to like have these short moments. So maybe when I'm talking a lot, you can also use them to reflect and chill. It's six o'clock. I feel like it's very scary to be in university, but it's also <laughs> Halloween. Um, <laughs> okay, I want to talk about the house project. Um, I think what I learned or what, I'm, uh, what I want to take from, from that experience is to see all different kinds of work people can do. To live with 25 people means that you are very much exposed to their work, to their living style, to their needs, to their fears, to their anger, to like anything that makes them them. And in this house project, we lived with obviously artists, politicians, activists, but also scientists. We worked with people that were doing martial art, that were working with flowers, that were working in politics um, or did social work. It was just a lot of different uh, people that came with a passion. Most of them were young, I must say that, um, and that also was difficult in times because everyone was longing for also intergenerational exchange. Um, and it got also complicated at times, especially when children were introduced to the house project. Singles and children living together sometimes is not like the best um, combination. Um, but what it also did was um, enabling people to share during dinner, one person was always cooking for everyone, to exchange what they were working on and to not be afraid to share information that they come up with or not be afraid of someone ripping them off, copying them or anything. They knew they were in a safe space and they could share their work and explore their work. And I think that is something that is very, very necessary and very important because then somebody else who comes from a different perspective or from a different background can share their input and their, their insight and kind of deepen what the person was previously working on. So we had a lot of exchange um, and this exchange happened also during projects that we created together. There were a lot of pro politic political projects that we started. Um, imagine Prince Albert at the time um, was still very, um, very new. It was a very new area, a new Keats, and people didn't really know each other. People very, were very ex estranged to one another. And the house project tried to create these like huge parties or huge events that people could uh, attend from all around the area to get to know each other, to come together, um, to experience um, what would later on become a uh, shared, shared space. And one thing that was very, very important in creating this, these events, which for example was one summer to um, get a lot of beach sand in our court, buy these huge containers, fill them up with water, 
uh, make drinks and invite everyone on like a cheap beach uh, vacation vibe one weekend long, uh, which was incredible because a lot of people didn't have money and it was beautiful to like be projected outside of very gray Berlin for two days. Um, and it made people feel very happy and very welcome and very homey. And what I saw behind this uh, project was all the people that were involved in the creation of it. And that is very important as well because there were people that were cooking for the people that were building. There were people that after, the, after creation uh, and exhaustion that would come to give uh, massages or like uh, communica just communicating. There's so many factors in creating a project and there's so many things that we love to forget. We love to think about work as just the work itself, but there is also what happens before work, there's what happens after work. And if we don't take care of each other and if we don't care of ourselves during these processes, um, work becomes very ugly sometimes because uh, it drains us and it exhausts us and then we cannot continue. So seeing that there's people that would clean, would organize, would make a little supper here and there, really like inspired me to then later on create my own spaces where I would invite people in and make sure that there's all these little um, positions and roles of people, friends that would come in to just like give a hug or just be there, like just atmosphere, an atmosphere model, super relevant. Um, and this is something that I learned there. And I also learned that there's creative, these so-called creative um, works or jobs, but that creativity is not bound to these jobs just because we give them that name. But creativity is something else. Creativity is cur curiosity. Creativity is something that you that you want to dive into to find something new, to find expression, to find yourself. Creativity is longing. Creativity is a story. Creativity is what you make out of what is presented to you. So um, seeing a physician being super into his own work and his own research showed me how creative one can be beyond the, the borders of what creativity means. Um, so yeah, these are a few things that I learned in this house project. Um, another thing about cr communication is how do we communicate? And we had a lot of people living in that house project that were not from Germany, that didn't speak German nor English, um, that spoke so many different languages and somehow obviously we wanted to communicate with one another. And how do you do this? And how do you do this in a way where you're not forced to learn something that takes time and care, but in a very immediate way? And that is sharing food, this is sharing music, this is sharing um, physical gestures. This is there's so much that you can communicate through. And especially, I think, food for me became such a central role because uh, we would every night would um, come together to share the food that someone cooked for everyone else. And we would experience different flavors. We would experience um, the music that they would play. We would experience the friends that they would bring to the cookout session. It would become a very visible um, communicational tool in this house project. And I think that really laid a a huge foundation for the work that I am doing today. Um, okay, f moving fast forward, I'm gonna play another sound. I feel like I talked a lot. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, like my high school, but very quickly.
school. Um, I ended up going to a French school in North of Berlin um, that was very elite, very boring, very hierarchical. And the reason for this was that my mom wanted me to have a contrast reality to the Lefties House project. She wanted me to learn about the real world, how to survive in a capitalist system. Uh, it was terrible, tragic, I want to say, for sure. Um, but I definitely learned more about communication as well, about how there's different language, how there is different language, not just in uh, French, German, etc., but in uh, also the way you talk, the way you make a message come across, the sound of your voice, who you have in front of you, who do you want to address? There's so many ways of communicating in your own body. And that's definitely something that I learned there as well. I just recently had uh, a very terrible experience with uh, ZDF. Um, I had to talk about, or I did talk about, uh, cultural appropriation um, with a person that, was, that had a very different perspective to mine. And during this conversation, I got very heated up and I got very angry. I was like, why do you think this? What is wrong with you? <laughs> and uh, he was talking to me in this like very political way and like this very informative, very, he, he wanted me to know that he obviously understands me, but there's so much that he can also say. And he kept doing this and I was like, oh my God. Everybody sees what you're doing, but this is something that you learn and this is part of communication. And I think that's very important that I learned in school. Um, and there was one, I'm, I'm gonna skip school now, there was just one other very important moment in that time I got to play um, at the German Opera, um, a play called Porgy and Bess, which is um, a play, an opera written by Gershwin and it's written for black voices. It's the first opera written uh, for black voices and mostly performed by a black cast. And the cast at the time came from South, America, uh, South Africa. They didn't speak German, they only spoke English. And my English at the time was very terrible. Um, but they welcomed me in such a heartwarming way I arrived every night after school and they were just singing and l they were loud and embracing and true to their emotions. And I took so much from that experience. And I remember that they asked me to cry on stage because in the scene, my father dies and my mother is singing this very well-known um, aria and she presses me against her, and I, they asked me to cry. And I was like, well, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I'm, I'm a child. Like, wh what do you mean, cry? <laughs> um, and every night, she would sing this aria, and she would press me into her body, and she would sweat because she was performing. She was this beautiful, big, black woman and she would sing from all of her body outward to tell this story. And she would press me in her body and really like use me as a stabilizer as well to like really get everything <laughs> out of her. And every night I would cry, cry, because it was so touching and you felt it. You really, really felt it. And this is such a beautiful experience or memory for me because this was a moment where I realized um, there's so much power in the way you transport something and the way you perform. Um, so I think that's already made me be curious in, in expression or specifically music. Um, I will come to like the after school years now. What time is it? How long have, have I spoken? Okay, music, sound.
in Cairn. Um, I'm going to hold the like post high school years very brief. The, the one thing that happened is I always had this plan on becoming a storyboard drawer. Since I was eight, I was like, I'm going to be a storyboard drawer. I did uh, internships and everything. I, I was drawing all day long. And I always knew I'm obviously going to study at ODK and then become like whatever. I had obviously no idea about the actual job. Um, and then I applied, I was 17, I finished school, I applied, didn't get in, and like my whole world was destroyed. And I was like, oh my god, what do I do? There's like, this is, was all of my plan. Um, so I, I had this like moment, maybe a few weeks, where I was just uh, hanging in limbo. But then I decided I need to figure out what's out there and I need to just say yes. And I had like three years where I said yes to everything, every job. I did accounting for a marketing consultant. I did personal assistant to a visual artist. I worked in a chocolate shop in a concert hall. I did film, I did gaffa camera, uh, direction assistant, I worked, uh, did social work. I literally said yes to everything and I felt pretty shit half of the time. Um, but it helped, it helped a lot because I learned a lot about what I do not want to do and I learned a lot about what I'm actually really interested in. And I think after doing this for so many years, at some point I realized it's not necessarily about the product itself that I like to do or not like to do. It's more about the environment that I'm in. And it's more about the, what I want to communicate through the environment that I'm in. So I always kind of like circle back to communication. I think like most of what I'm doing in the end ends up being communication right now, right here. Um, so I'm the, the yes years were super relevant. And after the three years of saying yes, I had a whole year of saying no. And I was like, I'm not going to do nothing. Nothing. It's over. I've had had it. I'm uh, just going to choose myself. And it was cute for like a few months, but then at some point I realized yes is also quite strong and there's not, there doesn't only lie power in no, which often uh, is communicated that way. So those are the yes years and I think they will, now that I'm going to talk about my album, they really informed a lot of what I'm doing in my work. And now we're getting to my work, sorry. N next sound, next sound. I, by the way, decided against a presentation because presentations somehow, to me personally, are annoying. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like there's so, there, like, there's people that are really good with presentations and then you look at them and you don't listen to what they're saying and it's like, it's, I don't know, it's whatever. There's no presentation. I'm going to show you a few pictures very soon, but not much. Um, talking about music. So the whole process of me becoming, becoming a musician is also quite random. I never really chose this, but after saying yes for so long, uh, I happened to also sing here and there. And uh, my best friend decided that uh, she really likes what I'm doing and that she sees a future in music for me and just sent a voice message to a producer and called me after and said, you're going to be a musician. And I was like, mm, sure, honey, um, that's going to happen. Uh, but then I decided I'm just going to say yes one more time and going to meet up with this producer. And it was actually really nice. And for half a year, I went to the studio again and again. And we were just writing and just creating. And I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. I was just doing it. 
and it felt really good because I had no I had no goal in mind. I had no pressure of performing. I had nothing to prove to anyone because I also didn't know what I was doing. So that was like half a year of just like grooving. And then eventually um, labels became interested or, and managements and they started reaching out and I got in conversation with them and I was like, okay, I guess I'm gonna just do it and like sign a contract because otherwise I'm, I'm probably not gonna follow this path because I don't have like this personal urge to become a pop star. I didn't have that. So I was like, if I have a contract, I'm kind of forced to like go with it for at least a while. Um, so I did that. I signed a contract and it was terrible. Let me tell you, uh, industries are not cute and they don't want, they don't have your best in mind. Um, they want a lot of profits and you should work with a very good attorneys and lawyers if you sign off your work. It's not cute. I did it anyways, I don't regret it. Um, and I learned a lot, especially that in Germany, uh, in the German music industry, they're not very open to gay people and they're also not very open to black people and I happen to be both. <laughs> <laughs> not the best start. Um, so I got asked to not perform my sexuality publicly in very charming emails. I got to uh, got asked to perform in German because it sells better on the market. There was a lot of fuckery happening. And, but because it wasn't like my dream and I wasn't like, I need to become this like super person, um, it was quite easy for me to say no. And because I had the structure and I've had built the environment around me of people that I trusted and that I communicated with that helped me in these situations that I could call, that I could talk to, that would um, inform my opinion even more and support me in my opinion. So it was quite easy for me to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this under no circumstances. And sometimes this feels like a defeat because you see that they're not willing to push you in the same way anymore because you're not compliant to what their vision is for you. And I'm pretty sure you will encounter this as well. But in the long run, it will feel so good because you did what was right for you and you did what was right in that very moment. And opportunities pass, but opportunities come back always. Um, one thing that I want to talk about, and I think as a musician it's quite easy to talk about it um, because we're already s being seen as these like spiritual <laughs> beings, even though we're doing a quite professional job, um, is trusting your guts. I know that every single time something big in my life happened, I felt it every single time. Like every single time I was going out the house and something in me was just there. It was super bright, super warm. I was walking down the streets and I was like, oof, ooh, something's happening. I know it. And we get very desensitized to our own bodies because we're used to so much stuff happening all the time, so much distraction, but going into your own body and really listening really helps you sorting out what is happening in front of you. And listening to this helped me a lot on my way. Um, so a lot of stuff happened. I released an EP, a debut EP, um, and it was welcomed quite nice in the market, uh, but it was also welcomed in a way that it was very like romanticized. They didn't see the political work that I put into my music because I sang about love, um, but there can be so much political work behind love, and they refused to see it, and I would sit in interview situations where they would um, applaud a, a white foreign member boy band singing about toxic masculinity, 
and then I would come on stage and they'd be like, oh, your songs are so pretty. And I was like, mm, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and that really rubbed me the wrong way, and I really did not like this. So after this EP um, of kind of like scattered song fragments, I decided I want to work on a bigger work of art. I want to create an album. It should tell a story from A to Z and it should encompass my ideology at that time about how political I want my art to be. And so I, I started writing a film script. I didn't start with music. I started with, okay, <laughs> sorry, I'm almost done. I started with a film script because I had, I envisioned this character that I wanted to portray. I wanted to, to, to portray a very modern human that is having this dream of success and is willing to do basically anything to reach it and on their way realizes that they're denying their own person. And so I wrote this whole script. I wrote a treatment. I got a lot of different people into the project to kind of fulfill this like movie idea. And from this script, I started creating the music. So I would go through the scenes that I created and I would start writing a song for each scene because each scene had a s a atmosphere, an emotion, had a message, had something to say. And I think that was really helping me. And then COVID happened. I had a period where I kind of lost track and I lost focus. And what then helped me to get back to what I wanted initially is meeting with different creatives and talking with them about my vision and my political idea and creating work that wasn't mine and creating work with other people. Um, to see that, to visualize what I had in mind and then come back to my own work and finalizing what I actually wanted to do because I needed to see it first. And this is what I'm, why I'm showing you everything that I did as a child because these clusters, these networks, these, these people that you get behind you and surrounding you, they are very important and necessary for your own work. They back up your work because you can always get out of your path you can always find a new perspective and then go back inwards and create. And this way, you will ve be very true to yourself and nobody can copy that. Nobody can ever copy what you're actually really doing yourself because they can't, they don't have the ability to, it, to do it. Mm, the sounds that I was showing you were all informed by water. There's always some sort of water element in the sounds if that was ice in a club, uh, the ocean next to a boat, a little river. Um, and I showed them to you because the, the work that I then did was very much informed by water. And when I, after writing the script for the movie, I realized that I'm highly inspired by nature. And I started walking a lot and going to nature and being close to water because water is the only element that naturally exists in all three stages as fluid, gas, and solid. And each of these stages make different sounds. So footsteps in snow make a different sound than cracking up the ice, then river flowing, then water drops dropping, then gas evaporating. And all these sounds are almost already music. If we listen to this, If you amplify this and put a synthesizer underneath, this is a song. It already has sound, it already has rhythm, it already has everything that is music. And I didn't create this, I just recorded it. Um, so yeah, I went back and I met with uh, friends and I told them about the ideas that I had and I created artworks with them. 
um, to kind of remind myself of what it is that I want to communicate and what the story is that I want to put into my music. And I came up with the first single of my debut album, Utopia, after shooting these pictures because they reminded me of what I actually wanted to do. And this is the cover of the upcoming album. Uh, and at last, I would maybe play you the song, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes I wanna be somebody Believe the lies they're feeding me So I don't see the history repeating So I don't see the history repeating Oh, I do want it Oh, I do want it And I'm so good to live Thank you, Sharon. Great. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you. Beautiful personal introduction to your life and to your work and everything around it. Let's give another warm applause, please. <laughs> so 
so mics on. Um, you've already created a very intimate setting here. Thank you for that. That means um, we can also ask questions. Um, I have a few questions um, that I kind of like to ask, but um, actually the stage is mainly for you. So if, if I should break the ice, I'll go first. Otherwise, if you already have questions, raise your hand. Then I break the ice and then you go, okay? Um, so, beautiful. Um, the title could have been The Art of Communication and the Power of Performance uh, of your lecture. And I also really like that you chose basically not to show images, but that you were in, uh, at the center of it and your story to it. And uh, I had this maybe only once or twice in this juxtaposition series that people really told the entire story. And it really gives a great picture of where an artist comes from. In many ways, you answered almost all of the questions that usually I'm interested um, in when talking to, to artists here, but maybe we can um, get a bit more in detail. Um, I'm um, personally always extremely fascinated about methodologies. So how, what are the methods of people? How do people work? And um, you kind of explained it in many ways. For example, with the music writing, you mentioned that you kind of record sound bites that take you back to that feeling. You said that you write a film script, and from this you start kind of creating songs. Um, but I mean, I guess there's many other ways, or maybe you have almost like a creative DNA, uh, like a certain method or code that you apply, mm, which I would be curious to hear, hear a little bit more about. Um, I don't really. I know a lot of people that have these like routines that they follow to then create. Um, I try always to come from different places. I think maybe that's almost my routine um, because everything that I'm that I focus on comes from a different place has a different audience in mind or a different emotion so I want to always I, I started the album with a film script I walk a lot it helps me a lot to walk and to listen to sounds that are wherever city, nature. Um, and then, for example, now I started a new project and the project is I'm trying to be very free in what I'm doing. Um, I'm writing only sex songs and um, so I'm trying not to think about what I'm doing and I come in, I work with producers um, and I decided for this project I would only work with two producers, one of them is here. Um, and uh, to just start thinking about what I'm doing when I'm in that very moment and in that very situation and just listen to whatever comes up in that very moment. Um, and then obviously I always collect. I think maybe that's one thing that I do. I always collect information and idea everywhere. So I always take a bunch of sound notes and I take a lot of notes on my phone. I have a billion notes on my phone. Sometimes that's just a sentence, sometimes just a feeling. It helps uh, to not use words a lot because words are very limiting and sometimes it's a sound, sometimes it's a color, sometimes it's a taste that you want to find and to, to grab these, do that, like get all of that information, it helps. Mm. And you just mentioned uh, you're working with two producers, which brings me to another topic that this juxtaposition is very much about, or actually all my work here at the Udika is um, collaborations across disciplines. Um, and that's a tricky thing. Uh, it's the most beautiful, but it's also the, 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 the trickiest. Like how do you, in particular in a creative process, how do you work with someone else who maybe has a different understanding than you, and how can you kind of make your own work also grow with input from the outside? But um, what's, what's your experience or what's your advice on um, yeah, collaborations, basically, in the creation of your work and um, in general? I think when I started out, I was, as I said, working with this label and they would get me together with a lot of hit makers, with like writers and producers that would be already successful and they, they know obviously like the potion to like a hip hop song. And it was terrible, like I didn't learn much and uh, I wrote songs that I very much disliked. 
Um, and then I started finding the people that I actually really liked working with. And then for the album, for example, because I was writing a lot about transness, I was writing a lot about being of color, being black. Um, and it was very important to me. And at that time, I felt I, had to pos I was in a position or I was comfortable and confident enough to demand my own work and to demand the people that I wanted to, to collaborate with. So for the album, I decided to write it all in London because I knew there's a lot more queer black females that are writers, that are making music. And I knew I needed to work with them because they would understand my story. I wouldn't have to be in this uncomfortable situation of like explaining everyone like, yes, I've experienced discrimination. Let's talk about it. Didn't have to do this. So the, the stories became a lot more in depth. Um, they become, became uh, multi-layered. And then uh, what I love is to, I love collaborating a lot because I always think, and that comes from my work in film, when I work with a team that I'm, that I'm familiar with, that I know, that I love, and that I trust, I always take a lot of preparation time. I communicate with them a lot beforehand, so they know the whole vision, they know every single aspect of what I want to do, and then I give them the full power in their array to execute it, and give them also the freedom to do that in their very own way, because they will always do it better than me. They will always see something that I'm not seeing, because that's not my profession. And in my experience, most of the time, this really created products that I myself loved, because I could see the product in the end, and I would be surprised by all the work that everybody else did. If I commanded everything, I would hate it. I'm, I'm a Virgo, I'm, I'm like super anal. Like if it doesn't, if something isn't working the way I wanted it, it's a problem. But if other people created it and other people saw, okay, they can like focus on something or they can like do their own creation, this gives me so much joy, so much joy. And another person that I work with a lot is in this room as well, um, a choreographer, Malena. Um, who, th we've been working for so long, the people that I work with, I've worked with them usually a lot for a long time because we develop ideas together and we create our signature language together. And uh, my best friend, for example, Don Arretino, a um, fashion designer, he's doing all of my clothes because we're at a point now where we don't really have to, like, I don't have to explain what I need. I can show him my work, I can tell him what my vision is, and he's just gonna make it. And this happens only when you, when you really get close to the people that you work with. Mm. Beautiful, actually, Don Aretino, that's how we met in the first place yeah. many years ago. And Marlene, uh, I had the pleasure to work with you as well. Um, okay, now I broke the ice with three questions, was it? Yeah, no, two. Um, first question to you guys. And don't be afraid, yeah, in the back. You have to be very loud, I guess. First of all, I'm very glad to see you guys in front of all the actors. Uh, my question is, what is the, the meaning of your artist name? Okay. <laughs> I repeat the question, because <laughs> Samantha told me. Um, great work, compliment. Uh, what's, the, what's the story behind your artist name? Um, it's quite easy, it's just my last name. Uh, my last name is Leaning Evert. It's a very German name. Um, but I started in the industry, and as I told you, I'm gay, I'm black, I'm singing in English, even though I'm in Germany. Um, and everyone was so confused that I thought, why not using this name that sounds Chinese and just fuck with their minds even more? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, here you go, but it's a ger boring German name. Yeah. Thank you for the first question. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And yeah, I mean, I was wondering if you're still going to make that film that you wrote the script for, and if you would like to tell us a little bit about it. I repeat the question again for those in the back row. It was regarding the film script, and if you're ever going to make that into a film, actually, that inspired the album. Unfortunately not. Um, the video for Utopia, we started working on this film just before COVID, 
COVID hit, uh, there were no fundings, um, so we had to freeze the project. And then I had the idea to just use uh, the scenes for the singles that I'm going to put out and create music videos for them instead. And you can watch them as a movie in the end. Um, but also that didn't work out, unfortunately, because I still have to work with a label that is not always super supportive. Um, but the video for Utopia, the song that you just heard, that is supposed to be kind of like the ending of the movie. And it is about this character who lives through six parallel um, realities. It's uh, their fears, their actual reality, social media, their dreams. Um, there was a, like a video game sequence. Um, and they would basically all have the same length. And they would always have a moment in that video where they realized that they were in a parallel dimension. And in the end, what they would be informed by is that only by combining all these six, la six layers, they would become whole. And that each layer of this person is extremely important part of them. Just to show a little bit that we, we, we're so much, and there's so much more to our reality than Sometimes we, we want to believe ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Nils Ruben. Um, I was wondering if you could share. So first of all, thank you very much. I also found it a really good idea of not showing anything. So it really worked out well, actually. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could share uh, maybe an anecdote or a feeling about uh, the Prenzlauer Berg you grew up in, since I kind of grew up in the same area maybe a couple of years later. But I always find it interesting to hear stories. For example, somebody told me, I don't know if it's a myth, but that a lot of doors were open, so you could just walk into houses and explore them or go on the roofs or something. And maybe if you can tell us something about the feeling you had there. Could you hear that question? Or the yeah. Also back row? Yeah. Good. First go of ahead. all, how dare you saying you grew up years later? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, no, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything was open. It was quite scary, actually, because you didn't, it was very dark. There wasn't uh, much electricity, so you didn't know if somebody was living there or not. And if so, who that was, and if you wanted to make an encounter with them. Um, it was definitely not clean at all. And the area that I grew up in, close to close to Helmholtzplatz, and I mean, m m have in mind, I was a child, there were a lot of uh, drug addicts and uh, very flamboyant drug addicts, to be honest. <laughs> like, th I remember there was this one, like, British person with, like, a huge head and, like, a lot of um, colorful scarves wrapped around their head. And we, as children, we would always give them certain names. And some of them had very loving names, and then some, some of them were kind of scary. And then uh, later on, my mother told me that she was actually partying with a lot of them in like the <laughs> beginning of the 90s. <laughs> and they didn't get out of the partying. And yeah, that's not like the most pleasant anecdote. I'm just okay, I can add to this one actually, because um, I'm born, so I was 12 when the wall came down. And so 90s is my teenage years. That's the fun years, no? when you really explore. And Prenzlauer Berg was totally open, open area. So I've literally been almost on every rooftop in Prenzlauer Berg in Mitte because all the doors were open and actually the entrance to the uh, Dachboden, the uh, addict, uh, no, addict, addict, <laughs> <laughs> not the addict, <laughs> you know, the, um, were also open or you could kick them open. So. And I like literally, and you could um, walk around the blocks, which is the beauty, no? The Berlin block, you could walk around the entire block. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating by saying that I've almost been on every block, also uh, uh, and uh, everywhere around there, were taken down by cops then, et cetera. But um, it's, it's been a, an amazing part, uh, period, because it was just open for exploration in a way that's no, now unimaginable. Uh, but at the time, it was not really, nobody thought 
of this. And I grew up in the West, in West Berlin, and this was really a huge, like from one day to another, the city doubled. We had a huge open playground to, to explore. And there were, were no rails. I remember no one, one New Year's Eve, we were 120 people on the rooftop. And I, like it's a phenomenon that nobody ever died because it was quite scary. And Prenzlau Berg at the time was also completely run down because they didn't basically didn't fix it since the Second World War. So usually one side of the street was still filled with bullet holes from the machine guns from the airplanes from you know the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Anyways, anecdote story. Story time's over. Next question, please. But well, thank you for that one. Yes. I understood. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I should talk a little bit more about why water uh, informed a lot of my work. Um, it is because um, at the time I, uh, I was with a lot of my friends that were either transitioning in that very moment or were just, had just transitioned. And we were we were talking a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot about just what people would, how people perceive gender and how people perceive people that transition, and also why um, why for people for trans uh, individuals sometimes it's important to uh, be very passable as the opposite gender. Um, when in fact there's so much more and there's so much experience also in within the transition and you learn so much and you develop so much while transitioning and your body changes and there's so much consciousness about what makes us humans and what makes us physical um, and so that that was a lot of conversation that we had and i was traveling between london and berlin and every time i kind of left London and I wrote my songs, I came back and on my way back I had this time to reflect because obviously there's not much that you can do. And at some point I realized, wow, I'm, I'm kind of like in this like transitional phase myself and in obviously different ways, um, but it was very freeing and I found that water kind of described the emotion that I felt because it, as I said, it exists in all three natural states and you can never capture it. When you capture water, it will eventually evaporate or when you have a frozen piece of water, um, it will uh, liquidate and it would always not do what you expect it to, to do. And it will always create new patterns, new shapes. When you look in your freezer, it's not always the same structure the crystals that form would always take on a different shape and a different cluster. And so water has this very powerful um, quality to it. And also what, like in the quantity of, in which water exists on this planet, how we all survive only through water and how it makes such interesting sounds, not just what I described before, but also in our bodies when we drink water and when we listen and what, how our bodies process it and how the, the sounds that it makes that often are very funny, um, it, it's just very informative and very powerful. And I felt like this was something that I really wanted to incorporate in, in the sounds as well. So there's, there's sounds on the album that are vapor, like vaporizing or uh, a stream of water or uh, whatever. Also the way we, um, we manipulated my voice on the album is kind of inspired by water. Like the producer that I worked with, we tried to find a way where it's, where we ch make a difference between a very dry voice, a very close voice and a very wet voice. He would like put a lot of um, uh, effects on my voice to make it sound very like liquid and rich. Mm -hmm. and to like give that feeling. Yeah. Nice one. And also it's called Utopia. Utopia is an island, so there is this oceanic thing to it too. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Uh, also, thank you for your beautiful talk and presentation. Um, I have a pretty simple question. How long took the creation process from 
writing scripts to like finishing novels. And like with the cadence and with the like um, deadlines, like from the label, or did you set deadlines for yourself? Oh, I'm gonna. Um, so did you hear the question last row? Probably not. No, okay. So uh, how long the, the, mm, was the process of creation from beginning to end of the album? And were there any obstacles in, in any way from deadlines or I don't know, what was the, what was the movement like, so to speak? No? Mm, it took all in all two years from writing this, maybe two and a half, from writing the script to finishing the last song, um, which means there's a lot of stages. You write the song, um, then you go over the production. At some point, it needs to be mixed, and in like the final stages uh, for it to be mastered. Um, and I was lucky to work with a team that was very established, and they never allowed. I wasn't really talking to my label at that time much, and they never allowed anyone to put external stress on us. And so we had like the complete freedom to work on it for as long as we needed it to be worked on. Um, and then at some point, I was the person actually becoming a little um, stressed that I didn't put something out. And I gave people deadlines and started saying, like, listen, it's done, it needs to get out. I also need to get it out of my system. I want to move on. So at some point, I was like pushing for it also to come out. I'm still pushing for it to come out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, with music, I experienced this with uh, also family and friends that it's uh, incredible how long it sometimes takes for an album, in particular if you're working with a major label, for the music to come out. Sometimes it's two years after its creation. Yeah. Um, when you maybe mm, emotionally are totally in a different stage already. Yeah, I think so. And uh, like for me right now, it's really hard to put out music or the music that I did because I'm a little detached to it. Um, but with that album in particular, I'm not stressed about it too much because the music, I didn't write it um, as a response to like very cur current uh, situations. I try to write it as basically kind of like my core manifest as an artist. So I'm not s pressured about releasing it. The songs that I'm working on right now that are very like quick and immediate, with them I feel like I kind of want to put them out like the day I wrote them. I'm like, let's just get it out with. It's, it's a vibe right now. It might not be tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Mm, I'm sorry. Maybe there. three more questions. Number one here, and then I saw you guys there. Yeah, so um, something that I remember from when you said it is uh, this uh, in the creation process, how you need to, when you are making people work towards your concept, how you need to take care of them during and after and you kind of related to the question before in this moment of exhaustion and you need to like move on uh, how do you still find the time or uh, the energy to do that care you were doing afterwards and yeah just some advice you might give yeah I, I repeat it I put it short how do you, how do you take care of your team no, in Especially the after. in the process of col collaboration, in particular afterwards. Yeah. Um, nice question, by the way. Yes, <laughs> thank yeah. you for the question. I think um, once it's really important to kind of differentiate between the people that you work with that are your friends as well, and then the people that you work with for a specific project. With them, I never feel very pressured to then afterwards take too much care about them because we have an agreement on creating a specific thing, and then we move on. And I think that's a very fair thing to do. Um, with the people that I'm very close and that I want to continue working with, um, I think the key motivator to me in everything is, as simple as it sounds, love. This is what my work is mostly about, because I think it's one of the strongest motivations that we have. And when you go into your work with love, and with care, and you work with people that you know they're also coming with passion and coming open-heartedly, then it's not really hard to take care. And, you, and that whatever exhaustion you experience, it's, 
rarely going to be so bad that you cannot then still be care caring for the people that you work with. Because that you get so much from it. And when you work with people that, and everyone's in it, like everyone's in on it, then in my experience, what happens most of the time is you go out of it with a lot more energy. And when you become this person that is so fixated on getting something done that you left and right hurt people, you're going to be exhausted and you're going to be alone. And that's never going to be healthy. Yeah, That sounded very sinister. I <laughs> it wasn't meant to be this drastic. Yeah, we had the, an artist in the first semester, and she had a very beautiful thing. That she said, to take care, you have to be careful. It's a super simple sentence, but it's very true. If you want to take care of someone, you have to also be careful in, in how you move. OK, uh, uh, two more questions. Pink uh, cap, and then over there, there's another one. Yeah. I repeat the question, super nice one, by the way. Uh, thank you. This is Joachim, no? Yes. Okay, sorry, you didn't tell me yet. Um, yeah, um, so the comparable artists that was mentioned on the article about you were Billie Holiday, um, uh, Frank Ocean, and Lauren Hill. And now the question was, is there an album that you grew up with that was on your bedside, like the most influ And I would like to extend this one, uh, to picking up, is there a certain album or an artist, or even a general main inspiration? First to this one, album. Uh, okay, I think there's like four, maybe four-ish albums or st music styles that really influenced me um, growing up. One is my mom uh, loved Afrobeats and we would always go listen to like live music at Yam. Uh, so like the, the beat and the warmth and the movement were definitely inspiring to me. Uh, then the house project that, that I lived in has this alternative music space called Ausland. Uh, it still exists, and they had the weirdest sounds happening there. And I had free access, so like on the weekends, I would go down there, and there would sometimes be five people in a close circle screaming at each other or like uh, modular, like atmospheric music that now is basically in every fashion event, um, what I first experienced there. So this was also very interesting to me, just from like it, the, the atmosphere that it created, it was quite dark mo most of the time. Um, and then we had these uh, audio books. Um, one was by, it was, with music by Vivaldi, uh, the Four Seasons, and but with a story. So it was telling the story of like this princess who meets uh, these four princes, and they are um, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, and she can't decide because everyone has such a beautiful side to them, and in the end she decides to marry all of four of them, which, first of all, yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they were playing the music as well, so I listened to a lot of classical music as well. But then for me personally, what was really important was that I was looking, and I remember I, was look I started looking for this at a very young age, I don't know why, but I was looking for a sort of like male sex symbol that wasn't straight, that wasn't having a high voice. I needed someone who had like a lower voice as well. Um, and I, I don't know why, but for me that was really important. And then I s when Woodkid came out, that was very inspiring to me um, because there was such a power and such a sultriness to, mm -hmm. to like this low, deep voice. And I was like, oh my God, that's something that I can relate to. Um, and Patrick Watson, Patrick Watson, Canadian, um, was very important. And I think in, that, in the beginning, it was actually male voices that were important to me because I could relate to them. 
But now, when I look at the artists that I'm most inspired by now, if that's Earth Eater, um, there's there's just so many artists um, that are so much more progress progressive, and I find that it's mostly queer or female artists, so they're more inspiring to me now. Pierre. <laughs> Don't worry, that's, that's yeah. enough inspiration. Um, and the last question, their question for the online audience so do you separate between you as pair and the artist Li Ning mm -hmm. if I have separated um, and if so how or if, if not then yes and no yes and no I studied culture sciences and uh, one thing that was very important to me uh, was um, performativity and I realized I'm I'm always performing like every day I'm performing whatever I feel like, um, and th that's also me being on stage. But there's definitely a difference, and that difference built itself over the years because I realized um, there's a part of me that I need to kind of protect. And I'm very, I'm very open, I'm very honest, I don't really have secrets, but there's a vulnerability that I only share with my friends. Um, and that's very important to me also, for them to know that this is only for them to experience. Um, but then it's really hard to differentiate between uh, these characters because both are me. And especially now, like this year, I had a lot of uh, struggles with the industry as well. And I realized that I cannot take it too personally. Actually, um, the producer that I work with, Antonia, did a panel discussion last year at a festival and there was a uh, person on stage that was saying something that I that struck such a chord with me. She said, um, it's always asked of artists to create personal work but not to take it personally. Mm -hmm. And that really is very interesting to me and true. Uh, it's a powerful uh, sentence. Uh, in many ways, I think that's really the core essence of of, of art, you know, and that that d the difficulty of kind of giving your everything to something, like all of your guts into it, but not to take it personal at the same time. It's a it's a tough one. Um, good luck with that. Um, no, so uh, thank you so much for the beautiful questions. I have always one final question that I've been asking since <coughs> three semesters now, and that's on advice. So <coughs> and then we have a great collection now um, of all the people that were here. Um, if you could give a final piece of advice for all the becoming artists, architects, um, journalists, um, fashion designers, product designers, um, musicians and, and actors, what would that be? Eat, sleep, repeat. <laughs> 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 no, I don't know. I think, um, do your thing, honestly. Like, who am I to tell you anything? Who is anyone to tell you anything? Uh, be awake, be curious, look around. Like, there, like this room, for example, there's so many people that do different things. There's so much potential t for creation. Um, leave your bubbles, try and leave your bubbles. Uh, be, be you and explore yourself more than you can, you do now. Yeah, thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. <laughs>
Benjamin uh, Husseby and Sehad Isek here, the founders of GmbH GmbH, a Berlin-based uh, fashion uh, brand and also the creative directors now of Trusadi. And they are um, gonna be here and talk about the work. So it's again a very special occasion and a great follow-up to your talk to be here again. And uh, thank you for all your reflections. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.